Now, no matter if you are going to be a pediatric nurse or if you're going to be an ER nurse, maybe even a floor nurse, you are at some point going to take care of somebody who has a fracture. So please pay attention, listen closely, because I'm going to tell you what you need to know. Oh yes, and a lot of these pictures are graphic, so you may want to put that food down. Just, you may have a weak stomach. I don't know. Maybe you have a strong stomach. Let's test it and see what happens. Here goes your picture. There are two uh, types of fractures. There is the one that is the most common type of fracture, which is usually caused by trauma. The other one is the pathological type of fracture. This is usually the result of metastatic cancer lesions, osteoporosis, and a condition known as Paget's disease. Usually for osteoporosis, we have females at more, uh, significantly more risk than males for this condition, and it usually increases after menopause. Some of the different ways we can prevent osteoporosis include increasing their calcium intake, ensuring that the patients have adequate intake of vitamin D and or exposure to sunlight. So oftentimes our primary care doctors will be drawing vitamin D levels on our patients, particularly the females because they're more prone to osteoporosis than men. We want to monitor for the development of osteoporosis, um, particularly in clients who have a thyroid disorder. So do make sure to double check the thyroid levels. We're going to uh, encourage our patients to engage in weight bearing exercises on a regular basis. This is going to make our bones very, very strong. If we do notice that they have um, osteoporosis, we're going to encourage them to take a biphosphonate and that is going to be something prescribed by the provider. I know a popular one that I always see is Boniva. This is going to slow the bone reabsorption process, thereby treating our osteoporosis. Always make sure that your patient understands how to prevent falls or accidents. And of course, the usual for our trauma patients, we're going to encourage them to be a little bit more safe, less risk-taking behaviors, use seat belts and helmets. Now note, in all of these things that I mentioned, these are for patients who have osteoporosis, which leads to the number one reason for pathological fracture, not osteoarthritis. That is completely a separate condition. They sound alike, but they're very different. Please make sure you have that information categorized appropriately in your brains. Let's talk about how to describe a fracture. If the fracture has not broken through the skin surface, we call this a closed or simple fracture. If the bone has actually disrupted the skin's integrity, causing an open wound and uh, tissue injury, we call this a open or compound fracture. Open fractures are graded based on the extent of the injury. We can say that a grade one is minimal skin damage. Grade two means there is uh, skin and muscle contusions, but there's not extensive soft tissue injury. And as you guessed, grade three is excessive damage to skin, muscles, nerves, and blood vessels. If you were to look at the picture there, would you grade it as a one, two, or three? Answer is three. Very good. Some other terminology when it comes to uh, determining the types of fractures include incomplete fracture and complete fracture. As you see, some of the pictures here include complete fractures. This is where the fracture goes through the entire bone, dividing it into two distinct parts. Now, some of the fractures are incomplete, meaning it just goes through the part of the bone, but it's still one full piece. We also have another way to describe them as displaced or non-displaced. In a displaced fracture, the bone has fragmented and they are no longer in alignment. In a non-displaced fracture, 
<clears throat> excuse me, in a non-displaced fracture, the bone has fragmented, but they do remain in alignment. There is uh, not included here, but something called a stress or fatigue fracture. This is the result when there is excessive strain from maybe recreational or athletic activities. The best thing for stress fractures is rest, and they'll heal up in about six weeks. As you see on the right hand side there, we have an example of a compression fracture. This occurs from a loading, loading force pressing on the callus bone. This condition is very common in older adults who have osteoporosis. It just sort of crumbles. Now back up to our type of bone fractures. I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I'm going to point out a few here maybe one such as the spiral fracture. This is a fracture that occurs from a twisting motion. I do want to note that this is a common finding with physical abuse if there is no sort of uh, sport related uh, story to collaborate it with. Anyway, it's important to note that these fractures, if they incur in children, can be the result of other causes as well in addition to physical abuse. So we try not to assume the worst in this delicate situation, but we do know that children are a vulnerable population and are prone to physical abuse. So uh, studies suggest that we be very careful in how we approach <coughs> an isolated spiral fracture case. However, if we do note multiple spiral fracture um, cases, maybe this child has sought multiple uh, multiple occasions for the same injury that we should go ahead and begin to think of abuse. The other example I have that I want to point out is a green stick fracture. This fracture occurs on one side but it doesn't extend completely through the bone. This often occurs in children. A green stick fracture occurs when a bone bends and cracks but instead of breaking completely into two separate pieces, it's similar to what a, uh, a small stick or a small branch would do. <clears throat> the big thing about this one is it's not considered a true fracture, but we will place them in a cast in hopes that they will protect it and not fall on their arm again. Here are some risk factors for fractures. I do feel like this is something that is not necessarily needed to be explained to you because we do know what are the risk factors for the most common type of fracture, which would be trauma. Um, but if I were to uh, take it on the angle of the pathological fractures, there is something to know about pathological fractures. First, Clients who are on long-term corticosteroid therapy, they actually can lose calcium from their bones due to the um, corticosteroids directly inhibiting those osteoblast function. Steroids also inhibit the GI uptake of calcium. Not to mention, steroids also enhance bone reabsorption. So it's a triple whammy for our bones destruction. So anybody who is on corticosteroid therapy for long term is prone to fractures. As clients age, their bones become less dense. That one's kind of a no brainer. Uh, another thing that I found that was really interesting for risk factors for fractures is lactose intolerance. They may not get good enough uh, absorption of all of the calcium and the vitamin D that they need. <laughs> and if you're wondering what is this picture of, this is to remind you that older um, females who are Caucasian do get oftentimes uh, more cases of osteoporosis because they're postmenopause and their bone just reabsorbs faster than it is um, made. So how do I know if a patient has a bone fracture? Well, we're going to do a very good physical assessment on them as well as 
uh, do an uptake of their history, including the uh, subjective information, such as uh, do you have a history of cancer? Uh, have you been on corticosteroid therapy? Um, we're going to look at their subjective uh, stories, such as is there pain uh, that it's reported upon movement? So the physical assessment and findings include crepitus. This is a grating sound created by the rubbing of bone fragments. Crepitus can be heard and it could be felt. And it sounds like clicking <clears throat> or grating. There's going to be deformity. This is going to be an internal rotation of an extremity. Maybe it's going to be shortened. There could possibly be visible uh, bone sticking out of the open fracture. These top two things are considered the cardinal signs of a bone fracture. We are going to see the other three signs. However, if I see the other three signs with the absent of the first two, I may be more likely to feel that the injured site is just a sprain or a strain. On to muscle spasms. We can definitely have muscle spasms as a result of the bone not being aligned and the pulling forces of the opposing muscles will begin to tremor, tremor and quake. Muscle spasms are quite painful for our patient, so oftentimes this can lead to us placing the patient in traction, which we'll get to that in a second. The patient's going to have edema. This is where the swelling is going to go to the localized area of trauma, and in the, this edema is going to be very firm, very tight, shiny, and it's going to be extremely tender to touch. It's definitely not pitting. <laughs> also, we're going to look for ecchymosis. This is going to look like bleeding into the underlying soft tissues, and blood into the tissues is extremely irritating, so do note that it's going to be also painful upon palpation. And you're going to notice a slight, slight blue hue. If their patient is dark-skinned, uh, it's a little bit harder to detect ecchymotic uh, areas, but you can still see because it will be a very dark shade. This is probably a no-brainer. The standard imaging for a fracture is x-ray. That's right, x-ray. We can also do a CT scan uh, to be able to determine very small fractures in delicate areas such as the wrist. I will say that a MRI is often used to determine the extent of the soft tissue damage that surrounds the fracture. I know that a bone scan is rarely ordered, but we can do a bone scan. A bone scan is using radioactive material and it's injected into the patient and it determines if hairline fractures are present and or if there's complications of delayed healing. Taking a look at this example, how would you classify this fracture if it did not go through the skin? Are you thinking complete, simple fracture? Excellent. In the event that you are present when a fracture occurs, whether inside the hospital or outside the hospital, you have a few responsibilities to help that patient. One of the first things you wanna do is immobilize the joint immobilize the fracture, wherever it may be, immobilize it and stabilize it. <clears throat> this is going to prevent further injury. This is going to help promote healing and circulation. It's going to reduce pain and it may even correct a deformity. You're going to make sure to monitor the client's vital signs and neurological status because it is possible to sustain significant injury to vital organs. This usually is the result of bone fragments puncturing the other organs. If you can, elevate the limb above the heart and apply ice to the site. Assess for bleeding. Even apply pressure over the site if needed. If there is a wound that is open as a result of a compound fracture or an open fracture, be sure to apply um, a sterile dressing over top. 
do remove clothing and jewelry near the injury or any kind of clothing or injury, excuse me, any kind of clothing or jewelry that is distal to the affected extremity. And it is possible for the client to experience shock. So please keep the client warm <clears throat> to maintain their blood pressure. There are a lot of different ways to immobilize a fracture. We're going to speak to cast in just a little bit. So I'm going to focus on splints and immobilizers on this slide. The top two pictures that you see there are examples of immobilizers. The bottom one there is an example of a splint. The purpose of these two items is that it provides support, it controls movement, and it prevents additional injury. What's a benefit to having a splint or immobilizer is that they are removable and they allow for the monitoring of the skin's edema and the skin's integrity. Oftentimes we will use a splint or even a immobilizer until um, the edema has gone down and when the swelling has gone down we can actually cast the extremity. Immobilizers are prefabricated and typically fastened with velcro straps. This means that while a patient is sitting in bed and they're resting we actually can open up and loosen some of the straps for the moment and then we tighten it back up when they're getting ready to get up and move. This allows the skin to breathe some. Application usually is based on a full-time or a part-time status. This is something that the doctor can clarify. Do make sure to observe for skin breakdown at any of the pressure points and cushion it if you do see some wearing on the skin. We're going to also talk a little bit later about internal fixation and external fixation. So before we get there, Let's talk about getting the bones back in place, back in line. We call this reduction. And there's two ways that you can reduce a bone. You can do a closed reduction or you can do an open reduction. The difference is whether you open the skin up or you fix the bone by not opening the skin up. Let me give you an example. So in closed reduction, we're actually gonna have a pulling force applied manually to realign the displaced bone fragments. Once the fracture is reduced, immobilization usually occurs and it allows the bone to heal. An example of this is if somebody is in um, a ski accident and then they have their arm uh, kind of bent at an odd way, like maybe they broke their humerus, to be able to get it back in place, oftentimes you can pull on the wrist without surgically opening up the person's arm and relaying them bones, but just by pulling on the wrist, it will align it in place enough for it to be casted. An example of open reduction is when a surgical incision is made and then the bones are mainly aligned and kept in place with plates and screws. I'm going to give you a picture on the next slide and I'm going to have you figure out which one is open reduction or which one is fixed with open reduction and which one is going to be fixed with closed reduction. Take a look here. On the left, we have a finger that was hit by a basketball at a bad angle. And as you can see, it is dislocated. And then on the other side, the right here, we also have a picture of a bone that was fractured from somebody falling. And this is where the bone's going up. And here's where part of it is coming back down. So which one of these was adjusted by closed reduction? Correct, this one. So somebody manually pulled this, there's no surgical incision, and it would pop in place. This is an example of open reduction. There is a surgical incision, the bone was pulled and pushed back into place, and then they use pins, wires, and screws to keep it in place where it should be. What's important to know about um, either of these reduction procedures. Well, when they do an open reduction, obviously this person is going to be in surgery and is going to be sedated and on a ventilator. 
When we do a closed reduction, it is often the nurse's responsibility to provide conscious sedation under the doctor's supervision. And if that's the case, you're gonna be monitoring their vital signs to make sure that they are still oxygenating adequately. And you're gonna make sure that they have adequate pain relief because this procedure is quite painful, as you can imagine. Here is an example of how to perform closed reduction. Oftentimes, it is the nurse's responsibility to provide the counter traction as the physician would be pulling and rotating the extremity into place. Everything you see here is part of the neurovascular assessment, and it is essential that you do this throughout the time that the limb is immobilized. We're going to perform these assessments every hour for the first 24 hours, and then every one to four hours thereafter, following the initial trauma. <clears throat> first thing we're going to assess is pain. You're going to assess the patient's pain level, the location, and frequency. Assess the pain using a 0 to 10 pain rating scale and have the client describe the pain. Next, you're going to immobilize. Uh, we're going to apply ice. You're going to elevate it. And you're going to make sure to use analgesics such as opioids and non-opioids, actually. But the next part of the neurovascular assessment is sensation. Assess the client for numbness and tingling of the sensation. Do note that if there is a loss of sensation, it may indicate nerve damage. Next thing to assess is skin temperature. Check the temperature of the affected extremity and <clears throat> do be sure to compare it with the other extremity. We should find that the extremity is going to be warm, not cool to touch. Cool skin may indicate decreased arterial perfusion. Do check the capillary refill. This is where you're going to press on the nail beds of the affected extremity until blanching occurs. Blood return should be noticed within three seconds. Prolonged refill indicates decreased arterial perfusion again. And nail beds that are cyanotic may indicate venous congestion. Pulses should be palpable and strong. They should definitely be equal to the unaffected extremity as well. Last but not least, you're going to check edema and movement. Edema can make it difficult to palpate pulses, FYI, so do know that you always have the option to Doppler the pulse. Now is the time where I would like to talk about the different type of casts and the casting materials. Casts are considered more effective than splints and immobilizers because they can't be removed by the client. There is the walking cast. This is where there is a rubber walking pad on the sole of the cast and assists the client in ambulating when weight bearing is allowed. There is a spica cast. A spica cast is actually what you see here on the patient's upper torso. This is a uh, cast where a portion of the trunk and one or two extremities are going to be casted. We oftentimes see a spica cast used on children with congenital hip dysplasia. The cast that you see in the picture is plaster of Paris. They are heavy, they are not water resistant, and do take about 24 to 72 hours to dry. Whew, long time. Then you have the synthetic fiberglass cast. These are lighter, they're stronger, they're water resistant, and once applied, they actually dry very quickly in like about 30 minutes. Body casts encircle the entire trunk of the body. A spica cast is a form of a body cast. Casting, let's see, what else do I want to say? Hmm. Because casts are circumferential immobilizers, once they are applied, we do always want to hope that the swelling has subsided. However, there's always that potential 
that when the cast was applied that the body still is swelling maybe because the limb is not elevated and if this is the case we may develop something called compartment syndrome so one of the responsibilities we have is to do good neurovascular assessments on our patient to make sure they do not develop compartment syndrome. I'm going to describe this a little bit more in just a moment. But do note if swelling does continue after the cast is applied, we will notice that the patient has unrelieved pain where ice doesn't help, elevating it doesn't help, and pain medication doesn't help. If this is the case, the physician can come in and split the cast in two sides and then wrap it in ACE wrap. We call this that the cast has been bivalved. Another thing that is neat about casts is if somebody has an area of skin, of broken skin integrity under the cast, we can actually saw a window into the cast area and this is going to allow for skin inspection. Here are some essential do's and don'ts for CAS. As I mentioned, you're gonna monitor the neurovascular status with all of those different elements for about every hour until 24 hours is up. And then every 24, uh, every four hours after that. You're gonna make sure to handle the cast with the palms and not the fingertips. This is extremely important until the cast is dry because you don't want to um, allow denting into the cast and those are going to be little pressure points for the patient. Prior to casting, the area, the, the limb I should say, should be cleaned and dried. We should remove all of the blood. We are going to wrap um, the arm or extremity in tubular cotton web. We're going to make sure this is done to maintain skin integrity and then you apply the casting material. Position the client so that warm, dry air circulates around the cast. <clears throat> Do make sure that the cast is supported maybe on a pillow. This is gonna allow for faster drying and prevent pressure um, from maybe a table to change the shape of a cast. So while it's drying, prop it up on a pillow. If any drainage is seen on the cast, I recommend outlining it, dating it, and timing it. This can be monitored for any additional drainage too. Do note that this is not a reliable indicator of the amount of drainage. This just allows us to track it. Clients are instructed not to place any foreign objects under the cast to avoid trauma to the skin. Itching under the cast can be relieved by blowing cool air from a hair dryer under the cast. Plastic coverings over the cast can be used to avoid soiling from urine or feces. Demonstrate how plastic bags can be used during baths and showers to keep the cast dry. As you see in the bottom left picture, this is not recommended. Report any areas under the cast that become painful or the patient describes as a hot spot. If it has increased drainage, is excessively hot to the touch, or is, um, is malodorous, this may be signs and symptoms of infection developing. Instruct the client to report immobility and complications such as shortness of breath, skin breakdown, and constipation. Uh, do you see that picture on the right? That is actually made from a 3D printer that an ER has. Um, this gentleman fractured his arm. They scanned his arm and then this 3D printer basically did this design and it's fabulous because it's not only protecting the bone, but this cast is partially removable. And as you can see, <clears throat> air is allowed to circulate to the skin. I find this technology is fantastic. What a use of application. Traction. 
The goals of traction are to use a pulling force to promote and maintain alignment of the injured area. We do these for a few reasons. One, to prevent soft tissue injury. Two, to realign the bone fragments. Three, to decrease muscle spasms and pain. And four, to correct or prevent further deformities. What's important to know about when a patient has traction is what type of traction do they have? What is the amount of weight on the traction? And whether or not we can remove it for nursing care. Always ask these three questions when you have a patient in traction. Here are a couple of different examples of traction types. There is manual traction, which is usually done in the immediate trauma setting, as you can see as the picture here. <clears throat> this is where the pulling force is applied by somebody's hands of the provider for temporary relief or temporary immobilization. This is also accompanied by sedation or anesthesia, and it's usually done when there's application of the immobilization device. They call that manual traction. Then we have skin traction. The primary purpose here, yes, is to decrease muscle spasms and immobilize the extremity either prior to or after surgery. The pulling force is applied by weights. They're attached to a rope to the client's skin, which is usually held on the skin by tape, straps, boots, or cuffs. As you can see that little baby, that is Bryant's traction that's used for congenital hip dislocation for children. And then the upper right here, you have Buck's traction. This is used preoperatively for hip fractures and femur fractures in adult clients. A picture down on the lower left, this is an example of skeletal traction. Now in skeletal traction, we are actually going to have ropes and um, tongs uh, involved. And these tongs have pins that are drilled through the bone. And this is going to assist for really good bone alignment. Usually the weights that are involved on skeletal traction are a little bit heavier, as in like 15 to 30 pounds. And they're going to be adding weight as needed for a larger client. Last traction we have is a halo as seen on the right. Screws are placed through the halo type bar that encircles the head into the outer table of the bone of the skull. The halo is attached to rods that are secured to a vest which is going to be worn by the client. Do ensure that a wrench is always available and attached to the side of the halo vest because in the event where CPR is necessary, you can take the wrench to remove the traction and provide care to the client. So halo vest always must have a wrench attached to it. This is another example of traction, particularly it's called straight traction. Do note that in traction like this, if the patient's bed is moved up or down, we probably need to readjust the traction height for this patient. Here's a question for you. Please take a moment to read it. I am going to assume that you have paused the scenario here. And I'm going to give you the answer. You ready for the answer? Good. I hope you got A, perform a neurovascular assessment. There are four things to know about traction care. <clears throat> the first one is time. Assess the neurovascular status of the affected part every hour for the first 24 hours, and then every four hours after that. Are you seeing a common theme here? <laughs> You're going to maintain the body's alignment and realign the patient if they 
have uncontrollable pain or if they report excessive amount of pain. So do realign them and reposition them first. Do routinely monitor the skin integrity and document it. Weights. Avoid lifting or removing weights. Ensure that weights hang freely and are not resting on the floor. If the weights are accidentally displaced, replace the weights immediately. If the problem is not corrected and the patient is reporting significant amount of pain uh, as a result of the weights being removed, do notify the provider. Check your knots. Ensure that the pulley ropes are free of knots, fraying, loosening, and improper positioning. Do this every 8 to 12 hours. Move the client if they have a halo as one unit. They're not going to have any knots, but make sure to move them as one unit without applying pressure to the rods. This prevents loosening of the pins and it prevents pain. Last but not least, do communicate with a doctor if the client experiences severe pain from muscle spasms, which are unrelieved by medications and repositioning. Now that you understand a little bit of the mechanisms of traction, I would like to talk about internal and external fixations. There's some advantages and disadvantages with both. First, external fixation. This is where we are going to immobilize the fracture using percutaneous pins and wires that are attached to a rigid external frame. Some advantages include immediate fracture stabilization, minimal blood loss occurring, definitely in comparison with the internal fixator, allowing early mobilization and ambulation, maintaining alignment of closed fractures that could not be aligned in a cast or a splint, and permitting of wound care with an open fracture. Some disadvantages include the risk of pin site infection, which could lead to osteomyelitis, potential overwhelming appearance to the client, which I agree, I slightly feel overwhelmed by this picture, and non-compliance issues. Take a look at this for a moment and look at all of the different nursing care that should be done for a client with an external fixator. Always advise your client to perform deep breathing exercises and leg exercises as uh, foot pumps or wiggling their toes. This is going to prevent the complications of immobilization such as pneumonia or thrombus formation. If we have a patient where only one limb is affected, please make sure to provide an anti-embolism stocking for the other leg. I'm going to talk about pin care on the next slide. When it comes to wearing clothes, a lot of times clothes have to be modified with Velcro so they can actually uh, not slide from the toes all the way up to the hips, but they can sort of be um, applied and wrapped kind of like how a brief would be applied with Velcro straps on the side. Pit care is done frequently throughout the skeletal traction and the external fixation that we're going to have on our patients with fractures. Do note that we are going to be cleaning it every 8 to 12 hours or one to two times uh, a shift <clears throat> with something called chlorhexidine. And we're going to use one cotton tip chlorhexidine swab for each pin site to prevent cross contamination. This is evidence in their picture up top. Crusting at the pin site should not be removed. Crusting is what you see in the bottom picture. This is actually the body's natural defense and mechanism to bacteria, so please make sure to leave the crust which develop. We're going to be monitoring our patient with external fixators for the drainage and for any redness. If you do note the drainage, please chart the color, 
the amount and the odor if present. Drainage is usually serous or serous sanguinous. Do chart and report any loosening of the pins. If there is tinting at the site where the skin rises up the pen, where the, you know, the skin's kind of climbing like a tent, do break the skin and push it back down. Skin tinting is not a good finding. If an external fixator is not appropriate for the patient, then we can do an internal fixation. And oftentimes when we will um, open up the bone to um, stabilize it, we are often going to do an open reduction. So as you see in the comment here, we have an open reduction internal fixation. And you can do an ORAF of any joint and or bone. But sometimes you will hear that commonly said and report, yeah, they had an ORIF of the right shoulder or an ORIF of the left tibia fibula. <clears throat> so now you understand what they mean when they say ORIF. Okay, by definition, open reduction refers to, uh, refers to the visualization of a fracture through the incision in the skin. An internal fixation is when plates, screws, pins and rods and prosthetics are used as needed. After the bone heals, the hardware may become permanent fixture inside their body or it may be removed. This really just depends on the location and the type of hardware. The nurse's responsibility includes monitoring the skin integrity. We can do this by making sure the heels are offloaded at the bed at all times and we're going to inspect the bony prominences every shift. Do observe if a cast is present for any post-operative drainage and do know that the cast may have a window cut in it which will allow us to visualize it. An elastic wrap is often used to help prevent edema at the patient's extremity. Do provide anti-embolism stockings and sequential compression devices to prevent DVTs. We're also going to make sure to administer the appropriate anticoagulants such as Lovenox, or anoxaparin and or heparin. We're going to monitor for signs and symptoms of infection at the incision site as well as systemic signs and symptoms of infection. That would be fever, tachycardia, and a rise in their white blood cell count and their erythrocyte sedimentation rate or sed rate. Do make sure to support their nutrition they need calcium, vitamin D, vitamin C, and protein. Occasionally, to increase their caloric intake, we may have to use supplements such as Ensure, as you see there in the picture. Do make sure that they have small, frequent meals with snacks, because oftentimes they do not feel like eating. Constipation is also an issue one from their immobility and two because of the narcotic use. Do know that when your patient gets out of bed for the first time they're going to experience some orthostatic hypotension so move the patient slowly and allow time for them to regain um, their sense of direction. Last but not least turn and reposition the patient every two hours for skin, um, skin health. As you can imagine, there is always a risk for complications. The first complication to discuss is compartment syndrome or acute compartment syndrome known as ACS. This is when the capillaries dilate in an attempt to pull oxygen into the tissue. This increases capillary permeability from the release of histamine and it leads to excessive and uncontrolled edema from the plasma proteins leaking into the interstitial fluid space. This pressure can result from external sources as well, such as a cast that is applied too tight or a constrictive bulky dressing. <clears throat> Internally, when we have such accumulation of blood and fluid within the muscle compartment, 
it exerts an excessive amount of pressure on the microvasculature and causes ischemia. For our nursing interventions, we want to make sure to identify that this is occurring, which usually occurs um, within the first day of either the application of the cast or it occurs the first day of the injury. And if we don't act fast, permanent damage can occur within four to six hours. Hence, this is why we assess the patient's extremity every hour for the first 24 hours. If we notice that the patient is showing signs of the five P's, this is probably the beginnings of compartment syndrome. So what is a nurse to do? We are to make sure to report it and oftentimes the case, we will get orders to loosen the constrictive dressing or cut the bandage or tape off. <clears throat> a surgical treatment may be required for the patient as well if there's not a boot or dressing to loosen. This is where we're going to do a fasciotomy. A surgeon will make an incision throughout the subcutaneous tissue and the fascia of the affected compartment, and they're going to relieve the pressure and restore circulation through this uh, incision. After the fasciotomy, an open wound will exist. They will stitch it, stitch it up with these plastic wires plastic wires, that's like an oxymoron, these plastic tubes, as you see on the upper right here. And this will require the nurse to do sterile packings and dressings until the wound is healed and closure occurs. Skin grafts may even be necessary for this client. Another complication following a fracture is a fat embolism and DBT. Let's talk about fat embolisms first. These are uh, fat globules will actually be released from the bone marrow into the vasculature, and then they're going to travel to the small blood vessels uh, inside the lungs. This is going to result in acute respiratory insufficiency and organ perfusion. This usually occurs, or fat embolism usually occurs within the first 48 hours following a long bone fracture and from a total joint arthroplasty, even an elective one. Some nursing interventions include making sure the client uh, is on bed rest following the fat embolism, make sure to prevent further um, mobilization of the bone, so ensure immobilization and minimal manipulation, and in the event they ha have a fat embolism, we have to uh, add oxygen, corticosteroids, vasopressors from the shock, and fluid replacement. Do make sure to also include pain and anti-anxiety anti medication as needed. If a patient has a DVT, you're also going to see very similar symptoms to the fat embolism, as you see listed here. For DVT prevention, we need to encourage early ambulation, apply anti-embolism stockings, and SCDs, or sequential compression devices. We're going to make sure to administer the anticoagulants as prescribed, encourage intake of fluids, this prevents hemoconcentration, which is a perfect state for DVTs. Encourage the patient to rotate their ankles and perform lower extremity exercises, such as like foot pumps and circumduction exercises. Before I go to the next slide, do pause here and be sure to read the signs and symptoms of fat embolism and DVTs. Osteomyelitis is when a patient has infection in the bone. It begins as an infl inflammation within the bone secondary to penetration, maybe by infectious organisms following either trauma or surgery or external fixators. How do you know if a patient has osteomyelitis? Well, we're going to see constant 
pulsating pain, which is gonna be localized and worse with movement. You're gonna see erythema over the site, as well as extreme edema. In older adults, we may not have a fever, but fever does oftentimes accompany osteomyelitis. You could probably guess what's gonna to happen to our white blood cell count and to our erythrocyte sedimentation rate. If you said increased for both of these, you are correct. To be able to detect this, we're gonna do a bone scan. This is where we're gonna use radioactive material and it's gonna be injected into the patient. And this is gonna help us diagnose osteomyelitis. MRIs can also facilitate a diagnosis. We're going to make sure our patient is going to be on long-term IV or oral antibiotics for osteomyelitis, and this is usually a course of three months or more. We can actually do hyperbaric oxygen treatments. This is going to be used to promote healing in chronic cases of osteomyelitis. osteomyelitis. And occasionally, we may have to even amputate the extremity if we are not able to treat the osteomyelitis successfully. Avascular necrosis can result from circulatory compromise that occurs after a fracture. In this situation, blood flow is disrupted to the fracture site and it results in ischemia, which unfortunately leads to uh, tissue and bone necrosis. This is a common finding following a hip fracture or in fractures with displacement of the bone. This also can occur in clients who receive long-term corticosteroid therapy for another condition that they have. They're at greatest risk for developing avascular necrosis. Oftentimes the treatment for this is to replace the damaged bone with maybe a graft or a prosthetic. Failure to heal. The two, um, two types of failure to heal fractures are a malunion or a nonunion. This is where the fracture has not healed within six months of injury and the patient may be experiencing a delayed union in that case. This occurs more frequently in older adults due to the impaired healing processes and advanced disease processes such as um, atherosclerosis. <clears throat> Malunion or nonunion may cause immo uh, immobilizing deformities of the bones involved. One way to treat this is to do electrical bone stimulation and bone grafting. Almost done. At least for this part. I'll do osteoarthritis later. Okay, that is the end of fractures. Let's begin discussing gout. Mmm, I like that picture. Gout or gouty arthritis is the most common inflammatory type of arthritis. It's a systemic disease caused by a disruption in purine metabolism. This is when uric acid crystals are deposited in joints and in body tissues. Gout is classified as either primary or secondary. Some examples of primary gout, which is the most common form, is um, when uric acid is you know, produced naturally by your body, but its excretion by the kidneys is slowed down or delayed. This can be genetic, um, and we see it occur in maybe middle to older adult males, maybe uh, roughly when they're about 40 to 50 years old, and it does occur in postmenopausal women. Now, secondary gout occurs because of another disease or another condition, such as chronic kidney failure, maybe excessive diuretic use. Um, ever heard of a crash diet? This is when somebody eats like only one thing for a period of time, like pancakes or waffles or something, cabbage. Uh, also, chemotherapy can lead to um, hyperuricemia or gout, secondary gout. It can affect people at any age and treatment is primarily based on fixing the underlying condition so they can not have these high levels of uric acid 
what you see here in this picture is tophi. <laughs> These are little um, pockets of uric acid crystals. They are very hard and solid on palpation. They're irregular in shape. They may break open and a gritty substance is discharged. Yes, this definitely, when they break open, would be an infection risk. Risk. Some common risk factors of gout would be uh, obesity. Now, most patients manage their gout pretty well at home. However, occasionally somebody will come in and present to the ER with extreme joint pain because they're having an acute uh, gout attack or gouty arthritis. It has a rapid, rapid onset. Um, usually a trigger is involved, such as in taking alcohol, certain red meats, or they've um, you know, taken a lot of diuretics. The pain is considered excruciating and it will occur in one singular joint. Not, it's not something that usually occurs uh, bilaterally. And so um, right here is what we would describe as a podagra. Um, this is where the great toe is affected from the excessive buildup of uric acid and the patient will report redness, swelling, um, inflammation, warmth, and it is extremely painful if touched or moved. If we were to draw a serum uric acid level on this patient, we would probably see that it's a greater than 6.5. And this is usually associated with a gout, um, gout attack, or even having hyperuricemia. If we were to um, diagnose this in addition to the symptoms, we would need to do a synovial joint aspiration. We would just put a needle in there, send the sample off, and it would let us know that it has um, elevated um, uric acid in there and uric acid crystals were present. So that is the last one. <clears throat> What drugs are we going to give this patient? The drugs we're going to give is colchicine or colchris. This is a good drug to give during an acute exacerbation of gout. And so it is used to decrease pain and inflammation. However, we need to be really careful in giving it to somebody who has impaired uh, kidney function. Uh, Motrin is very good to decrease pain and inflammation as well. However, like any kind of inset, make sure that the patient doesn't take this on an empty stomach and they also do not have impaired kidney function. Xyloprim, also known as allopurinol, is used um, with colchicine and it inhibits production of uric acid crystals. We want to make sure that the patient consumes plenty of water when they're on xyloprim or allopurinol and um, when I say a lot of water, I'm talking about 2,500 to about 3,000 milliliters of water per day. This other one here, your Cosuric or Probenicid, this is a long-term maintenance drug um, that we can give to patients. It inhibits uric acid reabsorption from the kidneys, and it's not exactly used for acute uh, gout attacks. Xyloprim and colchicine are will use a combination of drugs. All right, nutrition therapy. Uh, trigger foods such as alcohol, those starvation diets, even aspirin can lead, the aspirin intake can lead to hyperuricemia. Um, they may have to change and take a patient off diuretics, if that's the case. I mentioned red meats um, and organ meats such as liver Shellfish contain um, purines, 
and oily fish such as sardines. Flushing the kidneys is an extremely important intervention to do, um, whether or not they are on xylopram, but especially if they are on xylopram, otherwise known as allopurinol. We want to increase their intake of alkaline foods. Um, make sure that they are not taking in dairy products, citrus fruits, or juices. And the low purine diet is